He is the president of Wolfram Jarvis Institute, a leadership and organizational effectiveness consulting organization in Cupertino, California. Uh, Mr. Lee and his associates deliver leadership effectiveness, um, actually, I'm sorry, leadership development, team effectiveness, organizational change, and corporate culture programs and services to clients throughout the U.S. So please help me welcome Mr. Min Lei.
So I looked at this gentleman, he was sitting about right here, right here. And I jumped down from stage and I went over and I grabbed his hand and I said, thank you very much for staying to the very end. And he said, not at all, I'm the next speaker. <laughs> I want to apologize in advance to whoever this afternoon has to speak after me. Okay? Now, we're going to have until 4.30, and we're going to do a little bit of work together on the nature of leadership. And uh, this is a field that I have been studying ever since, actually before most of you were even born. And uh, I, don't, I still don't feel like I know very much. In fact, I want to establish an agreement with you. This afternoon, none of us will know more than any others. But what we'll attempt to do is learn from one another. Okay? So I'm actually going to get off the stage and uh, just talk to you a little bit about this. I want to find out a little bit about you. How many here, if you could raise your hands, are in a leadership role right now? in the organization. Okay? So, what, about a third of you are in a leadership role in a student organization of some type, right? Okay? So, how many, could you raise your hand, you're not in a leadership role? Okay. okay. Uh, but obviously you're here because you're interested in the topic of leadership, right? So, would you raise your hand if you have no interest in leadership, no interest in what I have to say, but you're just here because it looks like a fun place. And you can meet girls. And... Okay. All right. So, uh, there's a uh, handout in front of you, and uh, it's about treating emotional viruses in organizations. And right now, I would just like for you to have it and just put it aside, and we'll come back to it later, all right? What I want to do is, before I give you too much propaganda, uh, I want to find out already what you know about leadership, even before you came into the room this afternoon. And I think it's pretty substantial. So this is an exercise called Leaders I Have Known. And if you need to close your eyes to do this, that's fine if it helps. But what I want you to do is think about all of the people who ever had control or influence over you in your life. Right? From the first moment, they must have been your parents, maybe your grandparents, older brothers and sisters, maybe aunts and uncles, maybe uh, ministers or priests or rabbis or maybe school teachers, maybe principals, maybe counselors at school. Uh, maybe if you've been in sports, then that might have been your coaches, your assistant coaches, your sporting team captains. Um, if you worked part-time or full-time, then you might have had a supervisor a team leader, uh, a manager. You might have known an executive, a general manager. Uh, you might have had a mentor, a teacher, a professor. Okay? So this is a pretty long list I want you to think about. Okay, And recognize that each and every one of these people are still active and alive inside your head right now. They're all still in there. So would you take a moment, think about all of these people, and using your own criteria, would you select whoever you believe is the very best leader you've ever had? Okay? This is your best leader. Let's call this person A, because A is the first letter of the alphabet. This is your best leader ever. Keep that person in your mind. Okay? This is a person you've been very grateful to. This is a person who's been a role model for your life. This is a person you would like to be more like all the time. Now, would you also pick out from that long list of people 
the very worst leader you've ever had. Yeah, I know, it's Friday afternoon, you prefer not to have to think of that person. But just for the benefit of the exercise, think about that person for a moment. Let's refer to that person as your Z leader. Okay? You there? Okay. In the back of the handout, maybe there's a, a little bit of uh, paper at the uh, bottom of the page. So would you take a few, a couple of minutes, and would you write down three most memorable characteristics of your A leader? And then also write down three feelings that you have now when you think about A. When you're done with that, write down three most memorable characteristics of your Z leader. And then also write down how you feel now when you think about Z. Okay? So take about two, two and a half minutes to do that, would you? And, and look up so I know what you're done. A is your best, Z is your worst for you. you are looking up already, but uh, let me just give you another 20 seconds or so to complete the exercise. This is very important. Great 
Great speaker. Wow. My great leader was that that way too. Alright. How about this table? What was one characteristic for your A leader? Anybody? What? Composed. Like somebody who's calm and composed, right? Alright. How about from this table? Understanding. Somebody who's understanding. Yeah, how about this group? 
an easier time describing bad news than good news. Uh, yeah. Negative. Unresourceful. Still kill that man from the grave. 
Okay, what else? Impartial. You feel impartial? Uh, tell me a little more about that. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you feel like neutral about that person. Yeah, you sort of turn off your feelings about that person, right? Okay. It's, all, it's like a good defense mechanism to think of them like they're just a thing, right? Like the wind or the, the rain or whatever. Okay, what else? Yes, ma'am. You feel abandoned. That's a terrible feeling. Yes. That's right. Let be no longer. Right? Glad that Z is no longer in your life. Yes? Discriminating.
because you're a professional and you've got people depending on you. And the two voices in my head had an argument for a fraction of a second. And guess which one won? I got up. Conversations with yourself all the time, right? Isn't it interesting that a human being is this creature that can have an argument with itself, that can love itself or hate itself, that can even be aware of itself thinking about itself? Yes, we have a definite relationship with ourselves because we have self awareness. So, personal leadership leading oneself is actually a very important topic, right? Most of what we're going to talk about this afternoon is in that category. Who else do we lead? We lead our friends. Notice that we can't hire our friends and fire them, and we don't have formal power over them, and there's no law that says they have to listen to what we do. But some of us, have this wonderful ability to get our friends to do what we want. And some are very frustrated because they can't get their friends to do what they want. Bell Laboratories, about two and a half decades ago, went through this experience. Bell Labs used to be very proud of the fact that they had they had, they had hired the most number of PhDs compared to any other company. They had more PhDs than any other company, okay? And they discovered that only some of their PhDs were very effective. The rest were not. Now, PhDs are supposed to be highly educated, very smart, right? You've got to have high IQ. You've got to have good grades and all of that to get a high level degree like that. And yet, some of them were not very effective. So they brought in more researchers, more PhDs, to study these PhDs. Okay? And they discovered something fascinating. They discovered that the highly effective PhDs, whenever they sent out a request for information, a memo, or, you know, back in those days, they also had uh, the early version of email. These people would get responses back from the organization very quickly, just like that. Within a few hours, within a day or two, they get information back. Right? And then they went and studied the not so effective PhDs, and they discovered that these people would send out a request for information, and they would sit around and wait for days or weeks. And months may go by before they hear anything back. And so the researchers concluded that our success in life depends also on whether you have good social skills, how, how much leadership effectiveness you have over your friends. Okay. Who else do we lead? Siblings. Yeah? Siblings. Your siblings, someone already said that. Your pets? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> By the way, people who love their pets consider their pets like their children, right? Yeah. Let me ask you something. Do you lead your parents? <laughs> See how fast that is? <laughs> so some of you are very, very skilled at knowing how to manage the mood of your parents, knowing when is the right time to ask them for something, knowing just the right way to talk to them to get exactly what you need. Okay? And others may feel some frustration about it because somehow their parents are not that easy to leave. Right? Now, some of you have worked part-time or full-time or whatever. Do you need your bosses? Yeah. You do. That's called leading up. That's about knowing what the boss is all about. Knowing their values, their emotions, their motivations. Knowing how to get them to do exactly what you need. 
need us to do. At this very moment, I can leading me, you ever been a teacher or a speaker or a lecturer? Let me tell you a story. Remember BS student? Right? Behavior science, right? B.S. Skinner used to say that with the right kind of reinforcement, you could get people to do anything, right? So his freshman class one day decided that they were going to train him in a period of 50 minutes to lecture only from one side of the room on this side. Okay? And they determined that by the end of the hour, he would never wander over here anymore. You know how they did that? Completely without his knowledge. Every time he wandered over to the proper side of the room, they would sit up. They would maintain eye contact. They would laugh at his stupid jokes. <laughs> they would take, you know, serious notes as though he's the greatest source of wisdom in the world. You know how to do that, right? Why some of you are doing that now? Nah, you're training me. And every time he wanders over to the wrong side of the room, what do they do? They fall asleep in their chair. <laughs> they throw bits of paper at one another. They would whisper things in each other's ears. They would look out the window. They would daydream, play with their cell phone, whatever. No, they didn't have cell phones in those days. Okay? But you also know how to do that, don't you? See, there's a gentleman right now training me not to go over to this side of the room. <laughs> He falls asleep whenever I go to that side. But look, I go to the proper side of the room and he gets up. Okay? And you know what? They did that and they got him trained. And by the end of the hour, he lectured mostly in that side of the room. Once in a while, he wanders over here, but for a mysterious reason, he very quickly hurries back. He has no idea they were doing this. So can you train people to do things without their knowledge? Yes. 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 So you have an influence. You have a leadership role with everybody that you come into contact with. Okay? So, um, the work that I do focuses on helping people with <coughs> themselves what I call personal mastery, then being a positive influence in other people, that's called winning hearts and minds, then supervising people, which is, a, which is the positive influence, but this time you also have the formal authority. You can actually hire someone or fire someone, promote someone or demote someone, you can discipline them, you can penalize them. And by the way, parenting, young children, is very much like that. It's a form of supervisory leadership. Then we also have people at the top of organizations. They are executives. And they're dealing with organizational leadership, which is the very difficult task of balancing the needs of their multiple stakeholders. So if you're running a company, what does your customer want? We have the customer want lower price and better service. What do your employees want? Higher pay and less work. Those needs by the stakeholders are in conflict. It's your job to resolve those conflicts. Okay? Now, the chart says leadership develops from the inside out. That's a principle. And a principle is a rule that has been proven over and over again. And to test the principle, all you have to do is think. If I neglect or ignore or violate the principle, what happens? Okay. So let's say if I put all of my focus on the outer circle, on becoming famous, or becoming greatly admired by other people, or you know, winning public offices, Okay, that's where all of my focus is. The glory and the fame of leading other people. But then in the innermost circle of my life, I have seriously unresolved issues. I have dark shadows. I have even demons driving me. What are the consequences of that way of life? 
What will happen to me? So you open up the newspaper and you see a scandal where some executive or politician is forced to resign in disgrace. What usually happens? They are usually very successful in the outer circles, yes? But something unresolved, some dark shadow in the inner circle has finally come out and bitten them in the rear end, right? So when a representative of the House of Representatives tearfully on television admits to taking bribes, Right? and cries as he submits his resignation and begs for, to the people for, for forgiveness. Okay? The failure happens in the inner circle. Okay? So, this is a very, very important principle. Now, this is a, another very important principle. I was just talking with the uh, uh, director this morning of one of the major airports in the Bay Area, and he was talking to me about how challenging it is to motivate people. And I went over this model with him, and I said, well, motivation depends on two other forces that you've got to have under control. One is, any, you can motivate me to do anything that you want as long as you understand my value. And my values are anything that is most important to me. So if you understand my values, you can motivate me. Because you can predict what feelings I'm going to have when those values are activated. And you can also predict which way I'm going to move. So you can actually motivate me to work harder. You can motivate me to sacrifice my well-being. You can even motivate me to become a suicide bomber if you understand my values. Okay. So not too long ago, I was asked by a Silicon Valley high-tech company that had just had an IPO, and they had gone past their lockout period so the original 12 founders have now been able to cash in their stock options, and every one of them had achieved their dream, which was to become a multimillionaire, to have more money than they could ever possibly spend. And the next day, the president called me up, and he says, I'm deeply worried. What do you think he's worried about? Their motivation to work. He's afraid it's gone out the window. Right? Because for four or five years, these people have been working 80 and 90 hours a week, neglecting their health, their family, and they did all of this in order to become rich. And now they are rich. So he says to me, how do you continue to motivate these guys? Isn't that an interesting problem? What would you tell them? Is it hopeless? No. So what I said is, I gave him this model, and I said, look, if you want to motivate these people, understand their values, and values are personal, right? So what is most important to you may be different than what's most important to me. So I said, talk to each of them personally, and find out what they value. Does that make sense? So, for example, he and I talked to a young man about 28, 29 years old. He's not married. Uh, he doesn't really have much of a social life, but he loves technology. And he said to me, and his president, he says, I love new stuff. Don't ever make me maintain other people's stuff. I'm strictly a version 1.0 kind of guy. Okay? So the answer is very simple. The president gave him a new title. His job is now director in charge of new stuff. <laughs> OK? And he's highly motivated, and he works even harder than before. And you know, looking at him, you, 
you can hardly believe that he's got eight or ten million dollars in the bank. Doesn't care. He just allows to do stuff. You with me? So if you can understand someone's values, you can motivate them very well. Okay? Not everybody motivates the same way. So you've got to like be willing to talk to people and find out what's important to them. Alright? And then keep this in mind as we look at this model. This is called the energies dimension and it's in that handout that you have. Except that someone made an error and put it on the back of the next page. Okay? And try to imagine that the top of the chart is in black and the bottom of the chart is in red. Now, when Wolf Jarvis put together this model several decades ago, he was following the financial convention of, consult, uh, of accountants. So, black ink is good news. Red ink is bad news. In businesses, if you say, I'm in the red, that means you're losing money. Okay? In businesses, if you say, oh, I'm totally in the black right now, that means you're making money. So you notice that the convention I follow is I use black ink to talk about good things, and I use red ink to talk about bad things. Okay? Now, for those of us who are Asian, this is a little backward, right? Because for Vietnamese, you know, if you're gambling, and so da means you're winning. And so then means you're losing. So I'm going to ask you to sort of indulge me for a moment and really think sort of the Western way. Okay? Uh, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to use the terminology of being in the red or in the black. I'm going to call it being in the light and being in the dark. At the top of the chart, I'm in the light, and at the bottom, I'm in the dark, the dark side. You know, Obi Wan and Obi. Okay. So this is about human energies. How do we get energy into our body, by the way? Food, drink, and well, when we sleep, we conserve energy, but we don't get energy in unless we have an IV hooked up to us when we're sleeping, right? But that's it. Food, drink, and having the sunshine on our body, that's how we absorb energy. But animals have instincts, pre-programmed instincts, to tell them how to use that energy. We don't. We can decide how to use our energy. And this is how we can allocate our energy. At the top of the chart, if I if my energy is in the light, I am creative and constructive. And when I have all that light energy in me, I'm moving to and with, and I'm open, like this. At the bottom of the chart, my energies are said to be disruptive and destructive. I'm moving away and against. And I am defensive, like that. Okay? In the middle is a condition called ambivalent. And ambivalent is when half of me wants to move to and with, and the other half wants to move away and against. I talked recently to an executive, he's probably around early 40, he's the vice president of a container shipping company. And we were talking about business, and he's very happy with the conversation. And he said, do you mind if I tell you something about my marriage? And I said, I'm not a marriage counselor, but, you know, this is your time. You can say whatever you need to. And he said, uh, you know, I've been married for the last 20 years. And in 18 of those years, I have been ambivalent about my marriage. And I got a mental picture that half of him wants to leave. And the other half wants to stay, and he can't decide. So it happened. half. He's not completely dead. Now, the five columns you have there represent the five psychological stages of development for a human being. Column one, a newborn baby. Column two, an infant. Column three, a child. 
column four, adolescent, and column five, fully mature adult. Okay? So, a newborn baby, in order for that baby to enjoy being in the light, all he needs is to have his body feel comfortable and to be healthy. That's it. He doesn't need anything else. Nine or 12 months later, he becomes a young infant. At that stage, he knows, he can recognize the people close to him that he feels safe, secure, and trusting towards. And if a total stranger wants to hold him, he will cry, indicating feelings of insecurity, fear, anxiety, and also this is the stage where he learns anger and boredom. Okay. I have two boys, aged uh, now 16 and 13. And I miss the old days, you know, when they were just about six and three. And at the end of the day, I'd come to the house, I'd come into the house from the garage, and there they are behind the door, they'd be saying, Daddy's home. Now, they're moving to and with, and they're open, so I know they're in the black about my coming home. They're in the light about my coming home. They're happy with that. Okay. So, now, column three. A child at that age, three, five, six, he'll show you something that he's done, like a picture paint at school or a drawing or something. He'd say, what do you think of and is he asking me to be an art critic, do you think? What's he looking for? Approval, recognition, love. Oh, this is great work. Oh, you're so talented. This is nice, good effort, right? Because this is the beginning of their self-confidence. You and I also know how to drive that child into the red, into the dark side and teach him hatred, disapproval, rejection, humiliation, and inferiority. How do we do that? What are some good techniques to drive a young child into the dark side? Yes, well this is not very good, is it? Well you shouldn't be painting outside of the line like this. How about comparing? Right? You're not as talented as the neighbor's kid. When I was your age, I was a lot better than you are now. Right? You and I know how to do that because we have seen plenty of examples of, pet, of bad parenting. We've also had bad teachers who know how to drive us into the dark side very easily. Column four, adolescent stage of maturity. I had a parent stand up in a seminar a few months ago and she said, red face, she said, I have discovered that insanity is inherited. She said, you get it from your teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> now the reason teenage years are so difficult is because in column three you get love from your elders, from your parents, your teachers, from the people you know, above you. In column four, self-esteem means you've got to learn to love yourself. And that can be hard if that is not recognized as a legitimate need. This is the stage where you develop loyalty to your own self-centered values. This is the way I like to dress. This is the way I like to keep my room. This is the way I like to use my money. And this is who I like to have for friends. And these values are not necessarily the same as your parents' values. And it's so difficult because sometimes they don't know enough to let go, to let you develop your own values. Self-actualization is I am working on being the best person that I can be to maximize my potential as a separate human being. Self-actualization. Achievement. I want to do things well. I want to achieve, accomplish. And then my self-confidence in column three now becomes faith in myself, which is a higher level of self-confidence. 
But if that is not successful, if I can't stay at the top of column four, I go into the dark side too. And the dark side is filled with self-rejection, self-disgust. I look at myself in the mirror and I can't stand the face in the mirror. I don't think I'm talented enough or pretty enough or athletic enough or popular enough. And I'm disgusted with myself. And I feel great guilt about not living up to my parents' expectation. And I'm depressed and I feel like a failure. And lots and lots of very wonderful and talented people have experienced bottom of column four. For example, how do you and I know that Princess Diana spent some time at the bottom of column four when she was a teenager? And this feeling you know, lasted until she was in her early 30s. How do we know that she had it? Because for a young lady, this feeling at the bottom of column four sometimes shows up as eating disorders. And Princess Diana had plenty of it. She used to refer to herself as the ugly duckling, even though she was quite beautiful. Would it surprise you to know that many beautiful models consider themselves ugly? Okay. So that's a very, very destructive place. And fortunately, many of us can grow out of it as we approach maturity in column five. The top of column five, self-transcendence, means I am able to rise above my own separateness. I'm able to commit myself to causes, to ideals, to other people that are quite important, sometimes even more important than my concept of myself. Meaning says, I can make sense out of the crazy and difficult adversities that happen in life, like when bad things happen to good people. It was very hard to make sense out of that. But the sense of meaning is very, very important for a mature adult because I can make sense out of the stupid and crazy things that happen in life, the unfair things, okay? Fulfillment says all the different aspects of my life work together very well. And hope says I believe tomorrow is going to be better than today. And I'm actively working hard to make that happen. But there are some mature adults who do not succeed in staying at the top of column five. Where do they go? Into the dark side. And the dark side is characterized by futility, which means what if I do makes no difference. I give up, you know. Apathy, I don't care. Despair, there's no hope. And cynicism, I don't believe in anything. Cynical people suffer from the worst type of energy in the entire universe. Their life is really dark and bleak. And even, you know, their attempts at humor, you know, cynical humor is very, very draining, right? So this is a very, very bad place for adults to end up in. Apathy, futility, despair, cynicism. The one thing about the model is this, and then uh, one last thing I want to say to you, and then I'm going to ask you to do a little exercise among the table. Okay. The higher columns contain the stronger energies. The more mature energies, the stronger energies. The more in the red you are, the more likely you are to be sick. In fact, there's not an illness that cannot be caused or accelerated by the dark energies, by the red energies. Okay. Um, in fact, if I'm already sick physically and my psychological energies are about column five, I'm much more likely to give up trying to live. Now, in all successful organizations, and in all effective adults, this is what I noticed. They are more than willing to volunteer to go into the red at the 
bottom of columns one and two. They even volunteer to do it. As long as they get three, four, and five in the black. So athletes are like that. Athletes, for example, talk about, you know, um, Lance Armstrong, okay? Do you know how Lance Armstrong decides if he has had enough practice each day? He practices like seven or eight hours a day, okay? And do you know how he decides it's time to stop practicing each day? When his body is in pain, that's when he stops. So he volunteers to have bodily pain, okay? Now athletes, they go out on the field and they enter into a competition. They also volunteer to experience feelings of insecurity, anxiety, fear, and so forth. But they voluntarily have that because they believe they'll get three, four, and five on the light side. In other words, if I compete honestly and do my best. Okay, my fans will show me love and approval and acceptance and recognition. I will feel better about myself as a person in column four. And if I win, I'll bring honor to my team. Right? I'll bring honor to my team. There will be hope for the next time and so on and so forth. And you see that happen all the time. None of you here is a parent yet, right? Anybody here as a parent? Yes. Okay. So parents will do this regularly. Parents will go without food or sleep because they will care for their child, right? And they will willingly suffer insecurity and anxiety over the well-being of their children because in column three, maybe my children someday will return my love. Column four, because I am a good person and my value system says that this is what a good parent does. And then column five, self-transcendence, means I love them. I'm committed to these people. I want their well-being to be even more important than my own sometimes. Okay? So, this is the model. I've explained enough to you. And so it's now your turn to do a little bit of work and report back to me. What I want you to do is work in the small group. And I want you to have this model in front of you. Okay. Have this model in front of you. And I'd like you just to have a quick conversation within the group for about 15 minutes. And what, when you're done, nominate a spokesperson for the group to report back the results. And what I will ask you to report is this. What are three things, events or experiences, that you tend to be in the black, in the light of that? Okay? In other words, what gets you to be at the top of those columns? What gives you meaning? What gives you self-transcendence? What gives you hope? What makes you feel self-esteem? What makes you accomplished? And tell me what column your energy is in. Is it in column three, column four, or column five? Then I would also ask you to list three things, events or experiences, that you tend to be in the red or in the dark about. And you tend to go into the dark side. What tends to make you angry? What tends to make you cynical? What tends to make you depressed? What tends to make you feel rejected and humiliated? Okay? And then, what column those feelings show up in? Okay? Have one spoke person report that. Then, pick the one issue that gives you the most red energy, the most dark energy and brainstorm looking for five tools, techniques, or strategies that can help you move from the dark into the light. This is actually the most important part of the exercise. You only have 15 minutes. You're probably going to need 10 minutes to do the third piece. So work quickly. All right?
So, you know, is it, uh, I don't know, is it the, uh, well, I'll just wait to hear from you. So I'm going to give you 15 minutes. Uh, right now it's uh, 3.20, right? So we'll resume at 3.35. Are you ready for the spokesperson to report your findings? If you have a question, raise your hands and I'll come around and help you.
good about a job at home. Maybe security, column two. Maybe column four. Maybe there's some self-confidence involved in that column three, right? And then being recognized for your accomplishments is what column? Yes, and maybe you feel good about yourself. Maybe you feel more self-confidence. That could be number three also. Okay. Good. So let me kind of move over to this side kind of randomly. Anybody with their hands up? Why, why don't you talk about it? being in the light a little bit with us? Being around friends, cooking food for people. Yeah. Uh, deep conversations with your parents. What's the third one? Deep conversations with your parents. Oh, you're very fortunate. You're able to have positive, profound conversations with your parents. Right? You're very fortunate. Now, notice that in those three things, two of them have to do with relationships. Okay? When you feel good about a relationship, you have three, four, and five show up. See, I've been married for 21 years, and that marriage would not have lasted 21 years unless we have three, four, and five. When I feel three, that means I feel the love for me. When I feel five, that means I love her. The self-transcendence is love for others. And then whenever I have three and five together, I usually get four, which is I feel better about myself. Okay? So this is, you know, most of, uh, anybody here married? Most of you are still single, right? So some of you may be in a, a very uh, good relationship. If you're in a good relationship, you have three, four, and five. You're committed to that person, that's energy in column five. And that person loves you, so you get number three. And then you also feel good about yourself, which is number four. Right? And it's interesting because a lot of the relationships that don't work is usually missing one of those things. So for example, if I get married because I get three, but I don't have five. That means I get married to someone because they love me, but I don't really love them. Well, that doesn't last. Okay. Very good. Okay, so maybe, is this group talking yet? Yeah, that's right. How about this group over here? Okay. Things that put you in the light energy. Independence. Your independence. Yeah. What else? Being part of a good team. Being part of a good team. Yeah. And meeting inspirational people. And meeting inspirational people. Okay. So when you're feeling independence, what column are you in the light? Four. Independence is four, whereas five is interdependence. So being part of a good team, for example, I get five of them, right? Okay. And meeting people that inspire you puts you in what color? In the black. Is it an inspiration to meaning? Is it an inspiration to your own value? Or is it an inspiration just to feel loved, to accept it, to feel belong? Yeah, so it's probably inspired, right? Yeah. The Buddhist has a description for self-transcendence that goes like a drop of water returning to the ocean. It's the feeling that you're part of something much greater than your own separate identity. It's a very nice feeling. It's a very um, mature feeling. Okay, let's... Uh, Let's go over here to this group and let's hear about their red issue, the things that make them go to the dark side. Yeah. 